Yeah, so I'm Lizzie Wiggum from Mississippi Aquarium. I'm our senior education coordinator here with our education department. And um, so I do a lot with our summer camps and field trips and things like that. Um, so today we're just gonna talk about some of our ocean animals. We'll talk about the ocean in general, uh, probably touch on some conservation and community um, topics, just kind of talking about the coast and the Mississippi Sound in general. And then we'll wrap up with some questions. Uh, so pretty much what's behind me right now is going to be our ocean community habitat. This is uh, one of our larger habitats here at Mississippi Aquarium. It's about 400,000 gallons of saltwater. So all of our species here in this habitat are saltwater fish. Um, and those include our sharks, our stingrays, and then our bony fish as well. So those are your typical fish when you think about a fish are going to be bony fish. So we'll start with our differentiate. Uh, differentiators between uh, cartilaginous and bony fish. So if you see here, these are all of our fish. Um, the ones with the stripes are going to be our sheep's head. <clears throat> and so this is a pretty good example of a bony fish in the sense that these guys are local fish. You guys can go out and catch these in um, our bayous and the Mississippi Sound in general. Now the bony fish are going to have an actual bony skeleton and then they're gonna be able to live in both brackish, fresh, and salt water. And then our cartilaginous fish are gonna be those fish with the cartilaginous skeleton. So they're fully made of cartilage, they have zero bone in their body at all. And those are gonna be our stingrays, our skates, sharks, and then our fish called chimeras and paddlefish. So all of those guys are made out of cartilage instead of bone, and that allows them to be much more flexible. So as you can see, Seven is swimming over there, so our little uh, sandbar shark. He is fully made of cartilage and that allows them to be much more flexible. Um, and then it allows them also to maneuver through different habitats very well. So here at the aquarium, we also have a shark and ray touch pool. So up on our third floor of our Aquatic Wonders building, there is a habitat with our cow nose rays, our coral cat sharks, epaulette sharks, and then our white spotted bamboo sharks. And these guys are all little cartilaginous sharks that live in coral reefs or in tropical waters. So these guys are super cool because they are able to, like I said, move into different areas that are gonna be much more difficult for larger sharks or even bony fish to maneuver through. And that cartilaginous skeleton is gonna help them a lot with that. Now our coral cats and our epaulets are able to climb out of water for short periods of time. Epaulets can actually walk across coral reefs in order to move from uh, tide pool to tide pool in order to find more oxygenated water or in order to find more prey items. Now our bony fish um, are not going to be able to do that. Now we do have some gar and sturgeon that live in our freshwater habitat that are able to hold their breaths out of water for a long period of time because they've adapted a way to breathe air instead of just purely relying on oxygen dissolved in the water. And so those gar and sturgeon, uh, but most specifically gar are going to be able to gulp air from the surface and then use what we call a swim bladder. Um, or their stomachs in order to have a primitive lung. So they're able to absorb oxygen from the air as well, which is really cool. Um, now, what else, what else we have in here are gonna be, like I said, we have the sharks, but then we're also going to have our stingrays. So on the bottom of our habitat here, uh, we'll see if we can, we'll move to the other side here in a minute so you can get a better look at them because they like to sit on the other side are gonna be our Southern stingrays. So those are also going to be a native species to the Gulf of Mexico. And the Southern stingrays get very, very large. Uh, ours here are gonna be about four or three to four feet wide. Uh, they're very large animals. And like I said, they are purely made of cartilage, um, but there's one right there. Boop. So it's a Southern stingray. Um, so ours here are named Barney and Bam Bam. They're very adorable and uh, they like to hang out on the bottom of our habitats, so we call them a benthic species. So the benthics just mean the bottom, so benthos um, just purely means bottom. So we have those guys, and then we have our pelagic or our uh, surface swimmers, known as our countos stingrays. Uh, we can get a better look at them from the other side as well, because they like to hang out up at the top. And those guys are going to be, like I said, pelagic swimmers, so those they're going to be more surface dwellers. Now, all these fish are going to feed on other fish. Um, they don't feed on each other because uh, we make sure that all of our fish are very well fed. So especially our sharks 
Uh, those guys are what we call target trained or station trained for feeding. So our sharks in here are going to be our sandbar shark seven. He's the little, little guy you see swimming around. He is a pelagic shark. So he has to keep swimming in order to breathe, uh, which is also known as ram ventilation. So he leaves his little mouth open and then he swims and basically rams the water over his gills in order to continue to get oxygen from the water. Um, and then we have our two benthic species of sharks. So we have our nurse shark uh, named green bean. So green bean likes to hang out on the bottom. And she's a large nurse shark. Uh, occasionally she'll swim around in order to uh, go get her food or in order to find a more oxygenated station. Um, so she's a really cool shark. Maybe we'll get to see her tail in a little bit. She likes to hide on the bottom. Uh, and then we have our two spotted wobegongs. So our wobegongs are going to be species that, like I said, are benthic. They like to sit on the bottom, but these guys are going to be native to Australia. So our two spotted wobegongs are named uh, Sheila and Olivia. They're adorable. Um, highly high chance we might not be able to see them. They like to hide in the rock work. Um, so it's kind of hard to maneuver the camera over there, but if we get a chance to see them, they'll be really cool. So those are gonna be our shark species here. Um, then we also are gonna have lots of different species of bony fish. So we'll go over a few of those guys. And then if you guys have questions about anything, we'll take a break for some questions uh, and then I'll move over to the other side of the habitat so we can get a better look at some of our other species in here. So a few of our species that you can see right behind me are going to be our goliath groupers. So there's one swimming right over there. Uh, he's a very large fish. We have two of them in here. Uh, our goliath groupers are going to be some of our larger fish uh, as they can get to be over 300, 400 pounds. Uh, they're a very, very large species. Uh, they are a threatened species though due to overfishing. Um, those guys along with our um, Sand tiger sharks are going to be threatened due to overfishing as well. Um, oops, sorry. So our overfishing is most common due to people not knowing how to buy sustainable seafood. So if you guys ever want to help contribute to that cause and not decrease local populations of fish, the easy way to do that is shop sustainably. So there is a really cool app or a website that is run by the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium called Seafood Watch. The Seafood Watch is a website that will tell you which seafoods are going to be sustainable and good for the environment as opposed to unsustainable seafood, which will help uh, det be detrimental to the environment. Basically, it will increase the threatened species and kind of take away wild populations. Um, so as you can see, we got a nice school going on behind me. We have some palomatos. So those are going to be the guys with the really long fins. So the long dorsal and anal fin coming off the top and bottom of the, the fish. Um, then we also have our vermilion snapper. So those guys are also going to be a local species. So vermilion snapper are common to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and they are really pretty fish. Uh, then we have a bunch of grunts. So we have a lot of grunts here in the aquarium. The grunts are some of my favorites. Um, we call them grunts because they are able to actually make a grunting noise. So grunts are adapted with a few different varieties of noise making mechanics. Um, one, they can either grind their tooth plates. So fish are really cool in the fence since some of them have front teeth and then they'll also have what we call pharyngeal teeth or throat teeth. And they can grind those together in order to make a grunting noise. They can also use their muscles and their swim bladder in order to create a drumming or grunting noise as well. Um, and scientists are still postulating on the uh, where this evolved from or the actual significance of it, but a lot of the times these guys will use that grunting noise when they are feeding, um, which is thought to alert other fish to the presence of food so that other fish can come swim up and eat. Um, they also make the grunting noise when they're in distress or stressed out, and this also is thought to help warn other fish of danger or stressful um, situations. I know before we move to the other side, we're just going to touch real quick. We do have a freshwater habitat as well, like I said earlier. Our freshwater habitat houses um, four species of gar, uh, as well as an alligator snapping turtle and a lot of our sunfish. Uh, these guys are going to be around the coast and are most affected um, locally by what we call dead zones. And so dead zones are occurrences where we get a large influx of fertilizers or nutrients down the rivers into the Mississippi Sound. And when those nutrients come through, they actually feed the algae within the water. So algae occurs naturally within um, 
marine or aquatic environments. And this algae will feed on that um, fertilizer and then it will cause what we call an algal bloom. So the algae will bloom and then it'll increase into such biomass that it will actually kill itself off. So it'll darken itself. And then once the algae start dying off, then they get the algae starts getting eaten by bacteria. So once the algae get eaten by bacteria, they sink to the bottom. The bacteria are using up all of the oxygen within that ecosystem. And then we get what you call a dead zone or a hypoxic zone, which no longer has any viable oxygen for animals to utilize. So in these areas, we're gonna have a low amount of oxygen and then an increase in mortality of fish and other plants. And so because when something dies, the bacteria come and start eating it and then feeding off what's oxygen is available, you get this kind of cyclical of effect of just a lot of dead things occurring in this zone. That's why we call them dead zones. And so they're a huge problem for us, especially during summer months. So like July, um, we have a nice, dead, or not nice, but we have a pretty large dead zone going on currently. And these areas are going to only come out of that cyclical event once it starts to cool off and the water starts rotating. So once we get cool water on the top, it starts to sink and then we get water mixture again and that kind of ends the dead zone. Um, so the real problem with dead zones currently are the size of them. So they are get, keep getting larger and larger as more um, areas up north start expanding and using fertilizers within the farmland because all of that eventually runs into rivers and then out here into the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, does anyone have any questions before we move to the other side of this habitat? I can't tell if you're frozen or if I've frozen. Oh, okay. Uh, what kind of fish that keeps going behind? So yeah, it's a mermaid tail. Oh, that is an actual mermaid. Uh, so there is, well, having an event where a mermaid is going to be within our habitat here and she's gonna take pictures with some of our guests. So good eye, uh, there is, or was, I think she just went back up to the surface, a mermaid within this habitat. All right, any other questions? Okay. I think we're good to move on. Yeah, I'm gonna go rotate over to the other side of our habitat so you guys can get a better look and then we'll talk about some ocean zoning uh, and then we'll wrap up. Okay. You know, all right, we're back. There's our grouper. So I like to hang out on this side and there's our southern stingray. So I'm actually gonna step out of the way a little bit. Um, so our fish like to hang on this side mostly um, and this is a lot has a lot to do with where they are fed. So like I said, our fish here are gonna be station trained. Um, so our larger fish like our Goliath grouper and all of our stingrays and our sharks are trained in order to bring them to a certain section of the habitat with a target. So this target is going to have a certain pattern or symbol on it. And this pattern or symbol is known to the fish uh, because anytime we get new fish, we start to station train them and they know once they see this pattern, if they swim up to it and they boop it or hit it with their face or their nose or their body parts, then they're going to receive a reward, such as a fish. So by doing this, we're able to um, know how much each fish has eaten, uh, which is extremely important, especially in their veterinary care or just in general, all over health-wise, we're able to tell if something is wrong. It's one of the first things fish will stop doing once they start feeling bad or they begin to uh, get ill is they'll stop eating. And so by monitoring all of their feeding habits through target training and station training, we are going to be able to keep a better track on all of their health. We do the same thing for all of our uh, schooling fish in the sense that we are able to track their health, health based off of what we call herd health. So when they go for their yearly exams, uh, our veterinary team is going to test just a small sample of all of our schooling fish because as you guys can tell we have lots and lots of fish in here so our vet team is not going to test each and every single one they're going to test uh, a sample size or a percentage of the population and then they'll be able to tell based off of that how the school in general is doing and that is very effective in the sense that we don't have to utilize uh, or waste a bunch of um, 
resources, uh, testing each and every fish in the sense we're able to get a good sense of how everyone's doing, especially based off of our water quali quality as well. So this aquarium, we have about a million gallons of water in general, both fresh and salt. And our water quality is of the utmost importance in order to ensure that all of our animals are healthy and happy. Um, so like I said, we'll talk about our ocean zones real quick. So within the ocean, we have uh, different zones, which scientists have categorized based off of light, pressure, and temperature. So the surface of our water or the sunlight zone is going to be right at the top. And this zone is very important in the sense that it is where the majority of our sunlight is going to be. So this means it's majority where the majority of our, um, excuse me, majority of, of our plant life and corals are going to live. So in the sunlight or the epipelagic zone, it's going to be zero to 200 meters. This is where the, most of our life in the ocean is going to occur. It has our highest biomass. Oh, we got a feeding going on. So if you saw those fish start swimming up, they are being fed up at the surface. Um, so we do broadcast feeding for our schooling fish. Um, so instead of station training and target training each individual small fish, we throw in a um, certain weight of fish into the habitat and the fish will swim up, eat their fill, and then swim back down. We do this twice a day in order to ensure that all of our fish are going to have a chance to eat either in the morning or in the afternoon. Uh, yeah, so those are all the little guys swimming up at the top. So that's what we call our epipelagic zone. Then we have our mesopelagic, which will be, um, it'll get less sunlight, but it'll still receive some. And that's going to be 200 to 1,000 meters. So this is our twilight zone. So we're going to get um, not a whole bunch of light, but we'll still have a little bit. And we'll still have a pretty good biomass here. Uh, we'll get uh, migrating plankton, sharks, whales, um, squid, and things like that. And then we'll have our bathypelagic, so it's our next zone. That's going to be 1,000 to 4,000 meters. Uh, this zone, we really, really stop receiving light um, at all. So this area is, <clears throat> excuse me, very dark. And majority of our fish living here in our um, bathypelagic are now going to be mollusks. So things like crustaceans, or not crustaceans, mollusks, things like our snails, clams, um, and then you get your squids and octopus. Then you have abys abyssopelagic, that's 4,000 to 6,000 meters. This area is pretty much our abyss. So this is the bottom, almost the complete bottom of the ocean. So the bottom before you get to trenches is going to be our uh, abyssopelagic. So here it's mostly our, excuse me, um, deep water fish. So we have things such as the tripod fish, uh, the snail fish, and then you get a lot of your echinoderms or your sea cucumbers, your sea urchins, sea stars, things like that. They're all going to live pretty far down there. And our final one is the hadopelagic zone. So the hadopelagic is 6,000 to 1,000 meters. And this is the deepest areas of the ocean. So that's what we call the challenger deep within the Marianas Trench is the deepest area um, known on Earth within our oceans. And um, really not much survives down here. It's very barren, it's high pressure, low temperature, um, very dark areas of the ocean. Uh, it can get pretty extreme, especially once you come around what we call cold seeps, which may our coldest areas of the ocean, or uh, our thermal vents. So some of the hottest areas of the ocean because that's where um, the heat from the core or our mantle, I should say, uh, releases into the ocean and you get extreme, extreme temperatures in those areas. And not much can survive down there. Um, so it's very few species such as our tube worms. Um, you get a special species of clam and special species of crustaceans that can live here. Um, let's see, all right, so. Pretty much what I got for you guys. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, uh, I've got plenty of time to answer them. So it can be about the ocean, the aquarium, whatever. I just want to say that I really like watching the stingrays faces as they pass by. 
they're just oh, it, they're yeah. hilarious to me <laughs> it's pretty fantastic um they do that thing with their mouth so they're actually cleaning off some of the algae from the acrylic so here comes one right now okay, i was gonna ask you what they were doing i thought they were just breathing nope so they are breathing so you can see their gills as they uh, move oxygen across them but that middle piece is their mouth and so they're actually suctioning off so here was thank you thank you marnie um is what they're eating right there so they're kind so, of scraping off some of that algae so they're actually eating okay mm -hmm. that's cool so, yeah stingrays are pretty cool in the sense that they're omnivores so they'll eat both um animals so things like fish but as well they'll also eat plant life like algae and i didn't know that they could swim as fast as they do oh yes they're very very quick they're, they're just flying around everywhere Yep. Um, they're also really excited because they all just got fed. So they all speed up a little bit more right before and after feeding time. Mm -hmm. But they are very fast animals. So you have um, all the different layers that the ocean has in this, in this tank. Not, not quite. So here we're going to have um, really just the epipelagic fish. Uh, so that zero to 200 meters, um, those species. It's much more difficult to keep species uh, under human care that goes past the sunlight or the epipelagic zone because of the increased requirement for temperature um, decretion and then also pressure mm -hmm. uh, because those animals have to have pressure in order to continue to keep their body structure. So if you guys have ever seen a picture of a blobfish? Yes. Uh, they look really weird and gross, right? <laughs> yes. Well, they only look that way once they're brought up to the surface. Once they're, while they're down in the abyss in their actual habitat, they look like a regular fish. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that body structure is only upheld by the increased pressure of their habitat. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It is. So, um, if one of the fish gets sick, do you have vets or doctors there that go down and take care of them. You take them out and move them to a special tank. Yeah, so uh, it depends on the severity of the illness. Um, so we do have a full-time vet team located here at the aquarium. So we have two vets, Dr. Sean and Dr. Alexa, and then we have a full-time uh, vet tech. So that's uh, gonna be Mary Beth. So these guys are located on campus and they are excuse me, um, they're on call at all times. So if an animal is ever injured late at night or um, if an animal is in distress, they will arrive and come help take care of the animal. So if one is sick, they can treat them with medicines such as antibiotics or other means depending on the illness. Uh, if that has to happen, they can do that either by moving them to a different area. So we have an offsite facility called our Aquatic Research Center. So we can look, relocate them there if need be to get more one-on-one -on -one attention with the vet team. Uh, or we can just treat them here in the habitat. Um, like I said, it just depends. So um, does anyone else have any questions? Kelly says, that was awesome. Thank you. Wish we could have seen the mermaid again. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I didn't know how long they were going to be in here. Um, I don't know if they were what they were doing. So we just kind of hung out <laughs> on the other side while they were testing it out. Um, but I'll get, I can get that information on when they're going to be here if y'all want to come visit. Okay, that'd be great. Around. Yeah. All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, um, I'm going to head out. All right, thank you. Absolutely, thank you guys so much. And it's really dark here. There we go. Ha. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's fair to talk to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.